Welcome to the XY Advisor Podcast, a global community of financial advisors sharing and learning with one another to drive the positive evolution of financial advice. To get involved, go to xyadvisor.com or simply download the XY Advisor app. This series is brought to you by Hub24, Australia's leading provider of integrated platform, technology and data solutions to the wealth industry. By working with licensees and advisors, Hub24 is delivering innovative solutions and service excellence that enables you to do business your way, creating efficiencies for your business and value for your clients. These are just some of the reasons why advisors have rated Hub24 number one for overall satisfaction and best managed portfolio functionality six years running, empowering better financial futures together. Find out more at hub24.com.au. Hello and welcome to this topic series on delivering cost-effective advice with an entrepreneurial mindset. My name is Fraser Jack and in this episode number four of our five-part series, we hear from Nicola Beswick, who is finding her way as an entrepreneur with an existing traditional professional practice. Now, not everyone gets to start a business from scratch, but entering a more traditional pathway shouldn't suppress your entrepreneurial mindset. So if you want to do more within an existing practice, then this is the episode for you. Thank you for joining me, Nicola Beswick. This been, uh, it's been great having you on board in the very first episode when we had a, a good chat, but now we're getting into a little bit more of the nitty gritty. Uh, we're in this uh, episode four of our five part series and we are starting to unpack practices and the entrepreneurial mindset in practice and what's been going on uh, inside the, the businesses that uh, this is happening in. So thank you for joining us again. Thank you uh, for being part of the series. Um, let's start with a very quick overview of you and the business that you're in at the moment. Thank you, Fraser. And it's lovely to be here uh, talking again about the, the practice that I'm in. So the practice that I'm in is very much what we would have earmarked as the real traditional type of practice that has grown from the industry. And one of the things that we highlighted in the first session was the comparison between different professions and different organisations and comparing them to what the advice practice of what was the the last 20, 40 kind of years looked very similar to a legal firm where you had the hierarchy in terms of the partnerships and then your descending down, I guess, into the level of expertise and um, also experience um, and how the, the practices have built. So I work for a practice that is a very traditional in the sense that we've got the directors of the company and they essentially run the business at that real kind of high level. We've got a number of essentially all of the financial advisors that work with the company are also shareholders. And so when we look across the business at the moment, there's about 20 plus advisors and the majority of them being shareholders in the business as well. So very similar to if we look at a legal firm where you have the the partners that generally run the, the business and then you've got a lot of equity partners there that may not necessarily have the same level of dealings or steering the ship, I guess, so to speak, um, involved. The business is very much um, built on people having a real general sense across the board with everything associated within the advice arena. Uh, But we're also starting to see now a lot of people specialising in key areas. So one of the key things that I think we're starting to see not only in um, our firm but across the board is just developing those skill sets or those specialisations. Aged care is one of those things that is front of mind. We've got uh, a couple of advisors and they've got a real passion for providing that type of advice and we'll start seeing those larger organisations have those key specialisations within the, the industry. 
Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. And this is so, so this is a really interesting part that we're coming at this or angle that we're coming at this from because it's very easy to say, oh, we want to create a new business and we can just go and, and create it the way we want. Uh, but when we're, we enter into and become a shareholder in a business that's a larger, more traditional practice um, that, as you said, has the structure of, of like a law firm where you, you know, partners will will come in and exit and, and the business has that whole continuation of the business or continuity of the business, it's great for that. But then how do we apply an entrepreneurial mindset within that existing framework and then, you know, using that entrepreneurial mindset to then create or build the the, the, the client or the stream, um, uh, we, I think we use the term swimming between the swimming and the lanes sort of thing. How do we create those lanes and, 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 and do something that's slightly different within an existing framework? So that's really what I'm keen on sort of exploring with you today. And I know you've done that yeah. within this practice. Um, talk to us about where you started with that and what all the different ideas and thoughts that you had and before you decided on what you, you went down. One of the key things that I think we all need to be aware of, particularly now, is being really authentic in terms of who it is that we are and having ensuring that you're pre- presenting who you are to not only um, a, a practice but then also in that with clients and that then attracts different type of um, people I think one of the big things that we're starting to see now is making sure that uh, a business can continue on as the different people, our partners move out as particularly a lot of them retire or come through with these new or not so new education requirements. Um, But also making sure that you're maintaining and growing that client base within it because I think clients are the the, the blood life of any business and particularly in the area that we're in where it is about life and living life but then also comes death and it's building those really great relationships with your clients but then also potentially the families of clients that you have and and one thing that I've been really quite keen on and developing is also making sure that you're establishing those connections with clients, children or family really early on in the piece so you can actually continue on serving not just the client but the whole family unit and that approach to how you work with, say, a parent, 60, 65, 70 is very different to children from kind of use kind of my generation and then younger again we all have different kind of things that we're looking for and it's about pinpointing how do you connect with them um and keep that business uh flowing through i guess in in a better sense of the word yeah so just on that because we hear this word wealth distribution all the time you know the 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 greatest distribution of wealth etc etc and the three trillion dollar and now now i'm assuming that some of these uh baby boomers or people that are retired now that are that are living are going to try and spend a lot of their money but there's obviously going to be a lot of it left over and um and they need to be you know passed on to to future generations but it's often the case that the advisor that will have a great relationship with those clients um may not be the right person to have a great relationship with the kids exactly and that comes down to not only the I guess the personalities but what people can relate to and it's it comes back to that making sure that you in a, in a practice you've got multiple different types of people that you can have from a relationship type of perspective so you're matching um the the I guess the personalities or the 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 areas of expertise um right and and then being able to service that that family unit uh, more effectively you you're you're quite right what i guess financial planning meant to someone 20 years ago is very different to financial planning what we think now and they do take a very different type of thought process around um how do you build relationships how do you build trust within that and that's where coming back to um being not afraid to show who you are um from a a real authentic self um and i think that's where i look at things like social media as an example um we're all guilty of 
stalking someone on social media before you you look at that and i think that's no different to um wealth and what if we're talking about this wealth transfer that's happening at the moment the children of the parents are going to be out there googling us and and getting to not only know the firm but then also making sure that um they know or can get an understanding of who the advisor is that they're talking to before they even meet them so uh, i think embracing those they're not so new anymore but those technologies within the practice within any practice is really important and and that's something that i've started or have been doing is just being not afraid of actually saying this is who i am and this is what i want to be and this is this is what i um i what i believe in from a financial perspective i think if we look at that but a whole range of things i think people really like knowing that I couldn't agree more like around the old knowing what you stand for and, and, and having some information. And you're right, because of because of the technology that's available now, we can get an insight into a, into a human being before we meet with them. Um, but this, this, as you mentioned before, is a, um, is a different mindset and it is a fear because we've for many years gone um, uh, as professionals, um, you know, as lawyers, accountants, as, as advisors, there has been this professionalism bar that you kind of need to and it feels like the suit and tie type thing right you know you've you've got to you've got to live up to this this um stern uh seriousness of who you are as a person so that you can be a trusted professional whereas we know that humans don't behave that way there is an an innate inside their brain that goes i trust this person because they appear to be telling me the truth with the way they're presented and the way that they feel and their inner personality and all the stuff and if they see something different online on social media than this, you know, this other thing dressed in a suit, then it could well be that they, they have this incongruent feeling that those two things don't match. That's exactly right. I think that's the, the key thing, isn't it? Um, you've got to match who you are in person compared to like the likes of social media and, and who we are and what we're presenting ourselves. And there's nothing wrong or right about um embracing those technologies but it's about making sure that you're consistent um because there's nothing worse getting and meeting someone that you think you've got an idea of what they're like and then you meet them and go you're very different to that um persona that you've got um say um in in social media so um we're never going to um gel with everyone but i think there's a lot of people out there that we we will and that's why we need to have multiple people and and do if we're looking at a a business sense have multiple personalities multiple people many different people will trust and and work well with with others so um i think and i like the idea that when you are presenting yourself online just same way same way as when we do a podcast we tend not to do very many edits we just say this is me this is a stumbling questions that i don't ask or do ask that's the answers that you give because it's the same in a, in a meeting. It's exactly the same human that in the meeting would be who you listen to online, and it, you know whether it be podcast or videos or content that you're putting out. Exactly. Um, a lot of I know my meetings. You kind of go off on little tangents and and you talk about different things, but that's what builds that connection, isn't it? And um, not following a, a script is actually sometimes the best part because you get to get to see a lot of different things. Yep, exactly right. Now, I want to I dive into some of the th- stuff that you're doing inside your practice now because um, you mentioned estate planning before, but t- tell us about how you uh, find the, the or, or get to speak to the kids or the children of, um, you know, clients that might be, a, you know, a long-term client of another advisor in the business. One of the things that I find with that is it's having those conversations really early on with a client a lot of clients are very aware, particularly as they get older, about their own mortality and looking at what they are going to do and how they want to pass on particularly wealth to the next generation. I find clients are in, are in two very distinct camps when we come to this. We have, have the clients that are fully aware they know exactly what's going on they know that they need to bring the kids in at some stage to have a chat around what the the children will inherit at some point particularly those more wealthier clients that can't actually 
for the life of them spend what they've accumulated. But then you've got the other clients that um, may not necessarily have that as part of their, their thought process, particularly in a conscious way. Uh, so approaching those two different clients has been is quite a challenge. The the second camp um, are clients where they're not really thinking about it. That's more of a been a very, from my perspective, general kind of gradual approach when you start having conversations and 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 getting them to to end up in that that first camp where they're very aware of what's happening. I've had. Uh, particularly a couple of really neat stories around how I've engaged clients, but then also the children um, following um, particularly one couple's passing. And and a lot of that to, was to do with the clients or the parents themselves bringing the kids into the conversation quite early on in the piece. Um, the, the first person, kind of situation and client situation I can think of was quite a a early couple where um, they were very aware of health deteriorating between both of them and and health was deteriorating one from a more capacity kind of perspective and mental side of things the other one more more of a physical side and they particularly the the client that was more consciously aware, mentally aware of what was happening, but aware of the physical decline in health, made sure that the the children became more and more involved in the regular reviews that we would have. And that was over a number of years, um, the the children would become a little bit more um, just aware of who it is that I, I was in their parents' life. And then the parents were quite... Well, I guess open about their financial state, and so that made the conversations easier. But what I found was the the children of that couple became really quite comfortable with who I was as an advisor, and then started to be more engaged on their own financial perspective. And um, even though they were somewhat aware of what they would have ultimately inherent wanted to make sure that they were setting themselves up for the right kind of plan or future without taking into consideration anything that may come their way but when it did um and the these parents unfortunately passed away they had that relationship and that trust already built that had just been taken over time and and a, a, a slow pointed time i think um i think that's one of the the key things The second story I've got is uh, a gentleman who was very aware of his his wealth and very aware that his son, only child, was going to inherit a reasonable amount of money, um, but also very consciously aware that his son was maybe not in the right kind of financial headspace to deal with um, money or even really have that thought process. One of the how him and I um, agreed to work with together was very much him saying to me, I don't need to have two reviews a year on my portfolio. Um, you know, I know that's part of what you want, you have to do and legally in terms of the, the review. And so after a number of discussions, I said to him, how about what we do for one of those review time or that time that you've essentially paying me for is we'll have a quick update of your situation. We'll make sure everything's okay, but let's engage your son as part of those conversations and, and build on the, the education piece, not necessarily say the side, Hey, you're going to receive X, Y, but you're going to have those building blocks and those foundations ready. So when, the dad becomes a lot more comfortable with disclosing that information to his son. He's got that that understanding behind him. And that, I think, is just similar to what we do as advisors but necessarily don't see or, or even maybe have that time. Um, we're very busy in our, in our day-to-day practices doing what we need to do, but looking at different ways to engage the next generation or engage clients so they're actually aware and being able to feel comfortable with that wealth transfer that will happen. 
Yeah, that's two really, really good points you've just made there. Uh, obviously, with regards to, you know, setting expectations and, and, and trying to make sure that you're having those joint meetings or, or meetings earlier on where you're actually talking about what what's expected to cut off um, anything that happens in the future that might be a surprise to some of the kids as they're coming through, um, you know, especially if it's around estate equalisation and those sorts of things, that if it's all discussed up front and, and, and this is the reasons why and this is what's going to happen, then uh, it can be beneficial later. Um, but also, that, that's a really, really good point where you talk about the 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 fear in a parent's mind around whether the kids are going to squander the money or waste it or do something silly with it. Or, you know, a lot of the time the parents have worked really hard to get that money and they want to make sure it, it passes on, but they don't want it to become, um, you know, they would hate to think it became a, a burden for that child or it became something that, you know, that caused the, the child to to change who they are completely so it's a really interesting topic that you you then bring to the the clients that says are you i guess you'd say something like are your kids ready to receive that inheritance or do they need it you know ongoing education and 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 grounding uh before they go and um can make good decisions with the money that you've you're going to pass on to them and that's exactly right it's sometimes engaging um and i'm just thinking of another example so a third example that i've got at the moment um where these these clients that i've got have recently just uh become a, a new client of mine and they they've got three children all in very different stages of their lives and the the parents could see how much they benefit, benefited from the advice that i gave them in their situation and said to me would you talk to it to our children? Um, and I was like, of, of course, definitely. The, you, you you can't start those conversations early enough and build those relationships because you never know what's going to happen. And these clients, all the all the children, are all about buying a house at this point in time. Of course, because it's such a, a great Australian slash New Zealand dream that we all have. And for me, that was in total three hours of my time sitting down with each of these kids and going, okay, these are the basics. These are the things that you're doing. I may not see or talk to those kids for another year or two, but it's establishing those relationships quite early on. So the parents feel comfortable that they, if something ever happened, and these these parents are actually quite young for retirees. They're in their, their 60s um, or early 60s. And I know that... Um, the parents have got that trust and the kids now know who it is that is, is looking after them. So it's becoming that that family unit and, and treating each individual members the same way, but yet looking at what's really important to them to, to help build that relationship and, and continue on um, essentially making sure that we all do what we're doing. Yep. Exactly, and so much, so much of what an advisor is doing is just that looking for and understanding what those fears are, and and uh, explaining, getting the client to then understand how that uh, what they're doing is is you know they don't have to be fearful about that. So, um, I just wanted to touch on the estate planning. So, estate planning is essentially your uh, your avenue then to then create this opportunity. Is that right? Definitely, I think if we're sitting down having a an annual review with a client, one of the key things that we need to cover off is making sure estate planning affairs are in order, but then also talking about specific interests in the specific details um, of superannuation balances, tax, those kind of lovely things that us as advisors love, but clients don't necessarily understand. Um, but, but, then drawing in the conversation of what would happen if they pass away and where would that money go? What happens if both parents pass away? What happens with the children? Those kind of things. And ordinarily, you if you spend a little bit of time on that, you become you can find out so much more about what's going on in a client's life and their children's life that then opens up avenues to say, well, I'm happy to have a conversation with Jane because you know that that situation that she's in with her ex-husband or that's kind of her going through divorce maybe is not a a great thing and we need to make sure that things are split in a way that will I guess if we're going to be selfish benefit the the daughter of the client that we're we're advising um so it's those little kind of 
little questions that can drag so much out of a conversation and then you can create and and quite slightly build those those relationships um it's all about listening to those pain points listening to that fear and just having that little bit of i guess empathy to go well if i was my client what's going to be worrying me so much right now um and then if it's not sometimes the children but parents of clients um you know they may be going into you know declining health quite rapidly and actually saying aged care when you get to this point there's so many things that you need to be aware of um make sure that you don't go in blind come to us first so it's just planting that seed sometimes as well yeah, it, it certainly is. And, and like, like, uh, we sort of mentioned parents feeling like the money is left in saved hand is a, is a massive, um, uh, draw card for that. Um, I'm just thinking as we talk though, you know, the clients that, you know, say the parents, the parents have been the client for many years or mm-hmm. a client. Then the, we bring the kids in. We've sort of now got two clients that are under one family umbrella. Uh, and then that parent might go into aged care and the, the kids might become more the client. And so there's this, there's, there's this, this weird balance, I guess, from a, you know, who is my client point of view, um, that, that switches between and, and with and, and together with the, uh, you know, the kids as well as the parent. Oh, it completely. And it is a very fine line and one that you have to be very aware of um, what you're disclosing to each other in, in each of those kind of camps, but then making sure that you've also got that consent um and and the uh, the awareness i i'm just thinking about my lovely PSEA exam study and i think that's one of the standards that we had to to know and and if you think about not only who is our client but then the long-term implications of of any decisions you know it becomes such a broad ranging kind of area it's it can get complicated quite fast and that's where maybe sometimes you're not the right advisor for a whole family unit, but other advisors are better off suited taking, you know, looking after part of that family unit to help separate those kind of conflicts that naturally exist. Money and families, um, there's always going to be conflict there. Yes, 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 it's a constant balancing act. Um, Now, one of the things I wanted to talk to you about was just this this is a revenue stream, right? Because I mean, obviously, putting your entrepreneur's hat on, this is we're talking about a, a way that you speak to clients and a way that you you have conversations and, a, and something you focus on. But this is a this is a tactic, I guess, for bringing new clients into the business or existing business, as you mentioned, a traditional you know was a traditional business um, with your entrepreneurial mindset on to bring a new stream of you know revenue or new clients to the business. It is. If a, if a client or a, a child of a, an existing client has a relationship with another advisor um, and something happens to your client and they pass away, it, it, that shift of money, I guess, will go from your business to the other business where that relationship's already developed. And I think it's, it is very intentional in some ways of making sure that you're creating those conversations, those relationships quite early because you just never know when something like that will happen. But then you also don't know um, who the friends are of the parents' children. Um, And so it's all about um, making sure that not only do you build revenue within your business and, and, essentially do that but also maintaining the existing revenue that you have within the business um and and when it essentially moves from one one family to to another um within the the family unit it's all about that that relationship piece and and building that quite early on yeah now of course and a lot of that uh, we sort of mentioned the idea of social media and and just just publicly um, you know, talking about and getting out there the information about you so that people can find it, absorb it, and then start to, to grow a relationship with you. With you. you know, we're, you're obviously playing the long game with a lot of the stuff. So it's about maintaining a, a constant presence around of being, uh, of turning up on social media. What sort of stuff are you doing with social media and um, just making sure that you're there and around and about and can be seen? It can be. A whole range of different things um at the moment 
one of the, the big things that I, I like talking about is the that space where we're uh, the, the pro bono financial advice network uh, and, and actually showcasing what it is that advisors do. I think um, for me that building that awareness around who it is that we are from a, an advisor sense and, and we're wanting to give back that really can resonate with a lot of individuals out there because we all want to be able to help other people in some way. Um, so that's one of my big things at the moment where we're working on that publicity piece just to really showcase um, not just the work I do as a with my everyday advisor hat on, but the other work that we do uh, behind the scenes. But then also other things like if you look at and Instagram is one of those really interesting things where you can put on a whole range of aspects of, of who you are and what you're up to. Same with, with Facebook and things like that. But one thing that I've I've done probably and launched in the last, oh gosh, it would have been about just over 12 months ago now was um, my very own, very own website that was all about me and who I am as a person. And I thought part of that was to um help get people to know who I am and who I am as a person um and and get to know me through that not only through the work that I do as an advisor but the pro bono advice network and how my journey went from law to financial planning and and the reasons behind that but then also you know showing the really important things that are uh in my life like one of my not quite 500 animals, but um, animals that we have in our house and my partner, Mark, and you know, just getting a sense of me personally. And it's such a, a neat tool because then I, I feel you can, clients can engage with you quite easily and, and quite quickly. And those initial meetings that you have with people are a lot more personalized because they've already, they already know who you are a little bit and, and you can establish things that people people have in common with you. Yeah, I was going to say, I think it's a really good idea, that personal brand conversation for advisors to brand themselves and, and make sure that they're the ones that are telling the story about, you know, what it is that you do and how you do it and what your beliefs and passions and, and values are um, so that people can, you know, just can make a decision earlier on before they even meet you, whether they want to, um, you know, they want you to be their, their trusted advisor. Well, that's exactly it because the relationship bet is between the client and the advisor and it can become such a the 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 piece of, of being an advisor you can become that person that really trusted person quite quickly you know it's that very much a, I, I think about my hairdresser and um my my hairdresser i think i've i've continued with her for five years or so um it's a similar kind of thing you have that real you have that real trust with the hairdresser um and i think it advises and are in that that same kind of league um and and getting to know um and and show who you are and authentically coming back to that um that that word um is is really key so yes yeah, so if you're going to be asking a client to you know tell tell you all of their private and confidential information and and, and uh, they, they kind of want to do so on a two-way street they kind of want to know a little bit about you too just to, to make them happy with divulging all their information um now you mentioned the pro bono financial advice network do you want to give us a quick uh, overview of what the work you're doing with them uh so this is a, a really neat organization where we help people going through illness or some kind of disease um, and match them with an advisor who wants to give pro bono advice. Generally, a lot of these clients, um, and in fact, all these clients can't ordinarily afford advice. What that means is that essentially um, someone's getting the opportunity to sit in front of a client for maybe an hour and that could completely change their world. Uh, we've got this this gap at the moment where um, the the cost of advice is so high, um, and and ordinary people don't think that they can actually get advice 
And I think we give that opportunity to clients that need it the most to be able to at least get some some points across. So um, it's it's a real passion of of mine and the the stories that we've got from a client perspective that can be completely life changing. Um, so it's it's my extra full time job that I do <laughs> on top of my day job. Yeah, no, exactly. It, uh, it's And it's one of those things you can tell it lights you up when you talk about it. Um, now, this is obviously, uh, when I'm talking about entrepreneurs in advice, we talk about other pro- professions, other industries, uh, those sorts of things. And this is probably something that is fairly prevalent in your original your original profession, your, your legal profession. Yeah. Is that something that's driven you to want to be involved? Or? Uh, I think the... It drove me to be what drove me to be involved was just really the the small changes that us as advisors can do um, for people, and just seeing that opportunity to to make sure that people that really need it the most have got someone like a, a trusted source to go to. Um, we with PFAN do a lot of work. Well, predominantly a lot of our work is through people with multiple sclerosis. Um, and my dad actually has MS as well. So he's the the reason I became an advisor. Um, and then just naturally when I discovered the work that uh, PFAN does, I just, it instantly had that connection um, with with MS, and it's it's just taken me on on the journey that I am now with them. Um, the the law pro- legal profession is so much more um, well structured when it comes to the pro bono avenue. Um, it's it, uh, the legal profession's been around for forever and a day, and I think that's essentially where for financial advisors are, are probably hitting in terms of the, the structure and the way that we operate um, and to be part of just giving our, our services um, to someone that needs it the most, like lawyers do. Um, I think it, it will help grow the profession and the trust within the, the community. I couldn't agree more. Congratulations to on all the work that you, you do there. It's, uh, it really is inspiring. Thank you. Nicola, thank you so much for coming on this podcast series and sharing how you are working within a traditional practice, but still taking on an entrepreneurial mindset uh, and driving a new line of revenue for that business. Obviously, helping it, um, you know, with its continuity and 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 you know, diversification, if you like, as well with its client base. Uh, really appreciate your time and effort uh, with um, with all you've shared with us today. Pleasure. Thank you for having me. Now, if somebody wants to continue the conversation with you, what's the best way for them to get hold of you? Uh, LinkedIn is probably the best way to to reach out. Uh, it's got all my contact details there, particularly email address. If you want to have a look at my website that I've completely blatantly self promoted, um, you can go and have a look on on that as well. Um, but certainly, that's the best starting point to get in touch. And if advisors want to get involved with the the pro no, pro bono financial advice network or advisor network, what uh, what works do they do there? Uh, so we have a fabulous website, um, which is probonoadvice.com.au. Uh, so please jump on that website, have a look, and also more than welcome to reach out to me directly um, on LinkedIn or through our PFAN uh, page on LinkedIn as well. Wonderful. Thank you, Nicola. Thank you.